Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to announce the next speaker, who is Melanie Mutchitwood, who is going to speak about composition laws. Welcome. Thank you. So um, my talk uh, is going to be pretty light on technical details, uh, which I think is probably OK. We've heard a lot of uh, talks this week. But I'm more than happy to talk about technical details uh, later, if anyone is interested. But uh, I'll mostly leave them out of the talk. So. Um, my goals in this talk, I'm going to try to do a few things. First, I want to review two examples uh, of explicit group laws, which I think are probably familiar to almost everyone uh, in this room. And I want to review those to put them in the context of a much larger story. Uh, so it turns out that, that these two examples are just um, the, the first uh, stepping stones in a much larger story. And this larger story is relatively recent. A lot of the results in the larger story are in the past few years. And already, it's having a lot of really exciting theoretical uh, applications. Um, but computationally, not much is understood about it. So I want to suggest just a huge range, actually, of open problems in computational number theory and algebraic geometry that stem from this, uh, this larger story that we're just beginning to understand. So uh, the most uh, classical example of, uh, of an explicit group law is uh, this bijection, probably, I think, best attributed to Dedekin and Dirichlet, uh, between GL2z classes of primitive binary quadratic forms over the integers and isomorphism classes of uh, quadratic rings and elements of their class group. So uh, don't worry too much about if you think SL2 instead of GL2, or what I mean by, by twisted, you probably uh, know some version that classes of binary quadratic forms exactly tell you elements of a class group of, of quadratic orders and number fields, at least. So you're probably familiar with some version of, uh, of this bijection. And uh, one nice thing about it is that these objects on the left are very concrete, just ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, where a, b, and c are integers. So you simply have to write down three integers, not so bad, and you get an element of a class group of a quadratic ring. And one nice thing about this picture is uh, there's a group law on the right-hand side. So if we fix a c, the elements of uh, the ideal class group, uh, well, it's a group. So they have a composition law. They have uh, a group law. And therefore, given this bijection, there is a group law on the left-hand side. Now, of course, Gauss understood this group law before we really had the ideas of ideals and ideal classes and class groups. Um, and so this group law could, could be understood in another way. But, um, but now, this is probably the best modern viewpoint on the, ex the group law on binary quadratic forms, or more precisely, classes of binary quadratic forms. Um, so uh, one nice thing is it's not just theoretically that there exists a group law. In fact, uh, the group law on binary quadratic forms over the integers can be given explicitly in terms of uh, those coefficients a, b, c by polynomial formulas and some GCD operations. Uh, so it's a very uh, straightforward thing to compute, uh, there is one trick. I said, of course, the group law is not actually on binary quadratic forms, but on GL2z classes of binary quadratic forms. And so if you really wanted to compute explicitly, you also need a reduction theory to find a unique reduced representative in each GL2z class. But of course, um, uh, this Gauss uh, knew how to do, and, uh, and, and we certainly uh, can do pretty easily today. So that, that lets us then explicitly, uh, by finding reduced representatives for each class, uh, compute the group law. Um, and I'll just point out that the discriminant uh, b squared minus 4ac of the form on the left-hand side is the discriminant of the corresponding quadratic ring on the right-hand side, which is kind of important because I said to get the group law, we needed to fix 
the quadratic ring, and then we have a group law on the objects. Um, uh, so you need to be able to fix the quadratic ring in terms of the data of the binary quadratic form, which we can do in this simple way. Uh, so uh, after that example, another, I think, very familiar example to uh, a lot of folks, and there's lots of ways you can say this. I'm going to just try to say this in one way, is if we take uh, q to be a power of a prime, we have a bijection um, between, again, GL2 classes of primitive binary quadratic forms over FQ adjoint T and isomorphism classes of uh, CD, where I say C is a quadratic extension of FQT and D is an element of the class group of C. Uh, the, so what changed here, uh, it, this used to be Z and I've just replaced Z with FQT and here I've replaced Z with FQT. And I changed this letter to D instead of I, because in this context, most of us think of these as divisor classes instead of ideal classes. But that was uh, uh, purely for psychology. And so it looks like I've just taken the theorem and replaced Z with, with FQT, which is essentially uh, what I've done. And uh, again, we have that these classes of primitive uh, binary quadratic forms over FQT are just given by these simple polynomials. You just need to write down three elements in FQT, and that's what it means to give a uh, a primitive binary quadratic form. And again, uh, we have a group law on the right-hand side if we fix C, and uh, thus on the left-hand side. So I'm going to move that bijection up to the top and make a few remarks about it. Um, in case it doesn't look completely familiar to you yet, a quadratic extension of FQT, I haven't been very precise about what I mean by that, it's just a double cover of the affine line uh, over FQT. So a double cover of the line is just a hyperelliptic curve. Um, and the class group, at least in the case when our hyperelliptic curve is smooth, so the class group of the hyperelliptic curve is just its, uh, its Jacobian. Um, and so here I'm talking about elements of the Jacobian of hyperelliptic curves, and those are given by these binary quadratic forms over FQT. Um, and just like before, where b squared minus 4ac gave you the discriminant of the quadratic ring, here b squared minus 4ac uh, gives you the branch locus of the map from c to a1, which in characteristic not equal to 2 is enough to determine uh, the curve, the hyperelliptic curve c. Um, so there are lots of analogies between z and fqt, and so um, no one is perhaps surprised when I can take a theorem and I can pull Z out of it and replace it with FQT. And I think a lot of you are familiar with this idea that uh, the computations uh, of, the, of the group law on Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves are essentially the same as Gauss composition on, on binary quadratic forms over the integers. Um, yeah, so there are lots of things that are very special about Z and FQT, but often things that are true for one or two for the other. But this is, in fact, not one of uh, those things that, that relies on the special properties of the integers uh, and f, f q bracket t. So in fact, if we have any ring at all, uh, so I guess I mean, a, for, for me, rings are commutative. So maybe I should have said that. But uh, any commutative ring, or if you like to think more generally, we could be working not just over a ring that's somehow the affine case. We could be working over any variety or any scheme. If you want something more complicated than that, you can put, probably put it in there. Um, so uh, in amazingly general uh, uh, context, we have a similar bijection, which of course there are lots of rings and people have thought about a lot of um, examples of this over the years, and there are far too many people who have thought about this uh, to list them all, but I think only recently maybe have, have we understood the, the whole story. So there's a bijection between equivalence classes of primitive binary quadratic forms over a ring R, and isomorphism classes of CD, uh, where C is a quadratic R algebra, and D is an element of the class group of C. So essentially, this is taking the theorem that we've seen two examples of with z and fq bracket t and saying that it is, it is true just completely in general or with, with no, using nothing at all about, about z or fq bracket t. Um, and the only thing is I have to tell you a little more what I mean by, by all of these things um, in the theorem. But already the takeaway should be that there's something that all of these words mean such that, that, that this is true. Um, so there's just that same theorem. 
I'll tell you, you know, before I said a quadratic ring over z, and then I said a quadratic extension. So maybe I'll be a little more precise now. Uh, I'll say c is a quadratic R algebra. So a quadratic R algebra is an R algebra that's locally free rank 2 as an R module. So if we think, for example, just it, uh, say of R equals z, well, over z, locally free um, modules are free. And so I just mean, so a quadratic z algebra would just be a z algebra, meaning a ring, that's free rank 2 as a z module. So for example, that includes orders in uh, quadratic number fields. It includes a few more examples, like z adjoint x mod x squared is also a quadratic z algebra. But this is uh, precisely what I mean by these quadratic extensions. And if we'd like to think of R geometrically, so for example, if we take the geometric space uh, spec R, or more concretely, if instead of FQ of T, we're thinking about working over the affine line over FQ. Um, so if you weren't really thinking about rings, but you were thinking of, of curves with maps to the line, then a quadratic algebra over our base is just a double cover of the geometric space. So just like hyperelliptic curves are double covers of the line, um, if, we, if R here we think of, of geometrically quadratic R algebras exactly correspond to double covers of, of the, the geometric space that we're, that we're working over. Um, uh, here the class group so um, is it, precisely the group of invertible R modules, or geometrically you could think of as the group of line bundles on your space R. Um, when the quadratic cover is smooth, for example, if we're working over the line and we have a smooth hyperelliptic curve, um, then it's the, the class group is just the Jacobian group of divisors mod principal divisors. Um, Though in some sense, from the point of view of composition laws, maybe you don't even care exactly what the class group is, as long as I could tell you it's, it's a group. Um, OK, so this is just that uh, same theorem. And uh, now I've said a lot about the right-hand side and what those objects are. So the left-hand side, um, I should warn you, um, binary quadratic forms over R can be a little more subtle. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely there's no irreducibility condition. In fact, I only put the primitive condition up here for simplicity um, so that I didn't have to say some technical things. In fact, th th this, you can state this theorem where you use any binary quadratic form, including the one in which a, b, and c are all zero. Uh, yeah, so if you, well, you can have, um, a pr so primitive just means that the coefficients don't have a, a GCD, but if you have forms that are reducible over Q, that factor, say like over the integers, if you have a binary quadratic form that, that, that factors into two linear factors, that will correspond to an ideal class in uh, Z plus Z. Okay, so, so to get R times R on the right, you have to have more than just primitive Well. No, so t the, the things, um, so primitive actually corresponds to the fact that the like, ideal classes you get are invertible. Uh -oh. If you take non-primitive things over here, you get non-invertible ideal classes. Irreducibility of the form corresponds to the quadratic algebra being a domain. Okay. So if you take reducible forms, then you get quadratic algebras that are not domains, and you'll get, say, R plus R. Okay. So yeah, in fact, you know, this, this question illustrates one of the nice things about this bijection. It's kind of any question you might want to ask about the objects on uh, one side can be easily answered in terms of properties of objects on the other side. But yeah, so irreducibility gives you C being a domain. Primitive gives you that the, cla the ideal classes are actually invertible ideal classes. If you take away primitive, you can state a more complete theorem that involves non-invertible ideal classes. But then it wouldn't be a group. Since I'm trying to talk about group composition, I, I, I stuck to the primitive things here. So does that? Yeah. OK, great. Um, good question. So yeah, I was going to warn you about binary quadratic forms over R. Um, they're not, in general, given by ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared with a, b, and c, and r. So things get a little more complicated uh, than in the two cases that, that we've seen. This, this uh, meaning that binary quadratic forms are given uh, in this simple way, is only the case when all locally free modules over r are free. So for example, over z or over fq bracket t, 
uh, all locally free modules are free. And that's why we just have to write down these three numbers, A, B, and C, um, to get a uh, binary quadratic form over those rings. Um, so for example, all locally free modules over R are free if you're working in a Dedekind domain of class number one. Um, or in a polynomial ring. So this is actually a really deep theorem that all locally free modules over R are free in this example. Um, but so if you're working over a polynomial ring, which is just like working geometrically over affine space, then in fact you get um, this, this simple representation of binary quadratic forms over R, just uh, three numbers. And I will in fact tell you later what in general binary quadratic forms over R are. Um, Okay, so I just want to say, so from this last example here, where I said, okay, in this case where we have a polynomial ring over a field, all locally free modules are free. Um, you know, here's a, a case of this theorem, which I don't know, my guess is, uh, you know, I think hasn't been particularly thought about very much. So there's a bijection between GL2Z classes of primitive very binary quadratic forms uh, over FQ, now adjoined two variables, T1 and T2, with isomorphism classes of quadratic FQ bracket T1, T2 algebras and elements of the class group of, um, of C, those quadratic algebras. And here again, now to write down these primitive binary quadratic forms, you just need to write down three elements in this ring. Um, the C on the right-hand side, these quadratic algebras, they correspond geometrically to surfaces with degree two maps to the plane. So if you like to you know, think of this as how is this, a, I mean, a very straightforward generalization of a hyperelliptic curve, which is a geometric space with a double map or degree two map to the line. Uh, now here we're talking about surfaces with degree two maps to the plane. And what I'm telling you is that, is that their class groups uh, can be given explicitly in terms of binary quadratic forms whose coefficients are just polynomials in two variables uh, over, over the field that we're working over. Here I just said FQ for concreteness. Um, so now that, um, that I've talked about this, this general theorem, I want to talk about how the forms correspond to elements of the class group. So I think in, the, the, in these, the first two examples that I've talked about, I think you're probably familiar with the fact that the correspondence can be written down um, very concretely. And so in fact here, I want to answer this question a little more conceptually. Why is it that binary quadratic forms should have anything to do um, with class groups of double covers? Um, and I want to sort of convince you that it's just not some, some cosmic accident. Um, and so I'm going to actually illustrate over FQ uh, bracket T, since it seems like maybe the best e example for this, uh, for this conference. Um, but the idea that I'm going to explain to you here works over any ring or variety or scheme, it, over whatever um, base you want with the appropriate technical details filled in. This idea tells you why binary quadratic forms uh, uh, parameterize class groups of double covers. So in this example, um, where now I'm thinking over a specific base, I'm going to consider the affine line uh, across the projective line. <coughs> Um, so, and in, in this case, for concreteness, the affine line is going to have coordinate t, and the projective line is going to have two coordinates, x and y. Those will be my projective coordinates. And of course, I have a map from the affine line across the projective line to the affine line, just by forgetting my uh, uh, projective coordinates. And here, here's the, the, uh, the only <laughs> construction, in some sense, the form. So if I have a binary quadratic form over FQT, I'm now writing this A of T of X squared plus B of T of XY plus C of T of Y squared, just to remind you that these A, B, and C are polynomials uh, in T. And that form cuts out a curve in A1 cross P1. So A1 cross P1, that's a two-dimensional space. I put one relation on it here. And uh, a, we see that the form is homogeneous in X and Y, so it actually defines a legitimate kind of a form on P1, of course, the, in that, the degree doesn't matter for um, T. And so this form, this binary quadratic form, cuts out a curve in this A1 cross P1. So I'm just moving that fact up to the top here. So this curve in A1 cross P1 has a degree 2 map to A1. 
i.e. it's a double cover of A1. Well, why is that? I just take the map from, you know, from A1 cross P1 down to A1. And why is it a double cover? That just says if I fix a T, if I plug in a number and get an A, B, and C here, there should be, uh, there should be two solutions in P1. Well, there are because this is just a quadratic form on, on P1. So that's what makes it a double cover of A1 and or a quadratic FQT algebra equivalently. Uh, and, I, and this is the double cover. So the form itself in A1 cross P1 cuts out the double cover um, uh, that is the, is the, is the curve. Or it, in this case, it's a curve. But in general, is the quadratic algebra or the, or the double cover in this bijection, which I think is very simple and um, probably I mean, seems, I think, often to be overlooked. OK, so I knew I had to give you a curve and then an element of the class group. So there's the curve. And if I just say intersect C with the line y equals 0, um, so that's a line in the space, I get a divisor on C. In this case, I get a bunch of points. Uh, and that gives me the element of the class group. Uh, so, so very, very simple to get this divisor. In general, we have to sort of pull back O of 1 uh, from the P1. I'm, OK, I, I said I wouldn't give too many technical details. Maybe that's one little one. Of course, I took y equals 0, but that was just to do something simple. I could have taken x equals 0, or there's similar lines. And I would have obtained equivalent divisor, so the same element of the class group. So the construction of a quadratic cover and an element of the class group from a binary quadratic form, I just want to convince you conceptually is very simple. The form itself cuts out the double cover. I just take basically uh, any line coming from a point on the, on the P1, and that gives me uh, the divisor. So this description, as I've given it, it agrees with uh, the classical correspondence between binary quadratic forms and ideal classes of quadratic rings over Z. So it's giving you, uh, if you, you know, write it down in terms of formulas, it gives you the same formulas as Dedekind and Dirichlet they give you. And if we take just the, you know, forget about C, and we take the A, um, uh, B, over FQT, this gives the Mumford representation of points on the Jacobian of a hyperelliptic curve. The reason in this case people traditionally forget about C, I guess, is because you can recover it from B squared minus 4AC if you were remembering that instead. Um, so this, this very simple conceptual description gives us concretely the two, uh, the two explicit constructions that we know about. I'll just tell you how this, this last point here works. Um, so remember that b squared minus 4ac is the discriminant of the quadratic algebra or the branch locus of the quadratic cover. So over FQT, let, let me call that b squared minus 4ac f. So in characteristic not 2, of course, you, if I give you that, that a, b, and c, you expect that uh, to get a divisor on the curve z squared equals f of w, where f is you know, is this discriminant here in A2 is how you probably usually write that, that hyperelliptic curve. Um, so, well, let me, uh, for preciseness, let C prime be the curve that's defined by this equation. Uh, then I can explicitly uh, give you an isomorphism, I'll just write down here, between C, C for me was the curve cut out by my binary quadratic form, and C prime. C prime is the more traditional definition of a hyperelliptic curve in A2, and here's just a a, an explicit um, isomorphism from C to, to C prime. Um, and it turns out that, w that if you look at this isomorphism, you'll see that y is 0 on C. That was the divisor I picked exactly when a of z equals 0 and z equals b of z on C prime, which are the conditions you expect in the Mumford representation of a divisor on, on a, a, in a class group of a hyperelliptic curve or in a Jacobian of a hyperelliptic curve. Um, and so this gives. Uh, gives that usual representation. Um, I should say that uh, we, I had to say characteristic not equal to 2 to write, of course, the hyperelliptic curve in this way. Um, it, the theorem that I stated has absolutely no conditions on the characteristic of the ring, anything about 2. It's completely general, and it's totally well behaved um, with respect to 2 and uh, taking and working mod 2. And doesn't have any, yeah, so there are no sort of uh, special cases at two there. But of course, if you want to represent your hyperelliptic curve in this way, instead of representing it as AAX squared plus BX 
y plus c y squared, then you, you have to, to make cases that um, you have to be careful about too. <clears throat> All right, so um, I want to say that, so in general, just like in the two cases that we've seen, the beginning, um, in fact, in general, the composition law in this theorem can be given uniformly in terms of polynomial formulas and some GCD operations. Um, and that's actually, there's, that's actually true in a precise sense. Uh, the composition law, it pulls back from composition on the universal primitive form. Uh, that's a, a, a precise abstract sense that says there is a universal composition law that works um, in all rings. <coughs> But of course, for each R that you might be interested in, the actual method, if you were going to implement it, of uh, computation of this composition might, might differ, what might actually be reasonable. And for each R, <coughs> the reduction theory to find a unique representative in equivalence classes of forms. Remember, we had not just binary quadratic forms, but we had GL2Z classes of binary quadratic forms. And we needed a reduction theory to find a unique element in each of those classes that we can say this is our, our, our favorite element. We're going to use this to represent that class. In each R, this is uh, potentially a new problem. Uh, you know, as far as, uh, <laughs> as I know, in almost any case, both, both theoretically to find a, a reduction theory and algorithmically to actually be able to, to implement, say, reducing an element. Um, so other examples that I think would be uh, interesting to study already from just the description I've given you would be uh, orders in numbers fields uh, with, with trivial class group. Uh, then the reason I put that trivial class group condition is because I haven't even yet told you really what a binary quadratic form is when we don't have a trivial class group. Um, and this example that I just talked about, um, the affine plane over FQ. Uh, so in both of these cases, the main interesting as aspects would be um, understanding a reduction theory of, of binary quadratic forms and then actually being able to realistically uh, implement the, the composition law and the reduction theory. Um, so those were some cases where locally free R modules are always free. And I promised that I would tell you more. I would tell you what this theorem uh, actually says when locally free R modules are not necessarily free. OK, so I'm going to give you the definition of a binary quadratic form over R. And it starts with a locally free rank 2 R module V. So, so a binary quadratic form has several parts. It has this locally free rank 2 R module V. It has a locally free rank 1 R module L. And it has an element of the second symmetric power of the rank 2 module tensored with the rank 1 module. Um, so geometrically, uh, if you, like, if you prefer to think geometrically, this is a rank 2 vector bundle on the ring, a rank 1 vector bundle on the ring, and then a global section of this rank 3 vector bundle constructed out of the rank 2 and rank 1 vector bundles. OK, so that's what a binary quadratic form is uh, completely abstractly, but I'm going to get more uh, and more concrete. But first, let me just uh, do a reality check. An example, when V and L are free, so let's just say V is the free rank 2 R module generated by X and Y. And L, since it's supposed to just be rank 1, if it's free, we'll just call it R. So X and Y here are just formal to remind me that I have two copies of R here. Then an element of the second symmetric uh, power of Rx plus Ry tensored with R, the tensoring with R doesn't do anything, it are just the forms AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared. So when V and L are free in this definition, then elements of this, uh, of this object sim 2 V tensor L that I've constructed are just those binary quadratic forms with uh, three, three elements of R to write them down here, x squared plus bxy plus cy squared. Um, but even if we're in rings where locally free R modules are not always free, things aren't totally hopeless. So for example, if R is a Dedekind domain, uh, say like a maximal order in a number field or a smooth affine curve, then essentially the, then we do know what all the locally free rank 2 R modules are and the locally free rank 1 R modules are. And essentially we get a type of binary quadratic form for each element of the class group of R. 
So before we had just sort of one type, we just had to write down A, B, and C. We always get this type because, of course, there's always a free rank 2 R module and a free rank 1 R module. But in general, if the class group is not trivial, we'll now have several types of binary quadratic forms, um, uh, a type for each element of the class group, roughly. Uh, but each of these types, then, is, is completely explicit. And I'm going to give a more concrete example on the next slide. Um, but I want to say that morally, you would imagine here, if you're working over some R, you, uh, uh, computationally, you would compute this class group once, um, uh, this class group of R. And then you'd be computing, say, lots of class groups of quadratic extensions of R. So there might be some work here to, to compute this class group once, and oh, you do it once and for all, but then you can compute class groups of, of lots of quadratic extensions. OK, so I promised I'd give a, a concrete example of these different wild types of binary quadratic forms, and I hope to convince you that they're not actually that scary. So let's say, OK, be a maximal order in a number field, and I be a non-principal ideal. And more concretely, I'll take everyone's uh, a favorite example of this, z adjoined square root of minus 5. And here is a non-principal ideal in that ring. OK, so now I'm going to take v. I need it to be a locally free rank to um, OK module, but not free. So I'm just going to take it as OK x plus, here's the ideal y. And then I'll just let l be OK. So instead of having OK x plus OK y, I just have OK x plus the ideal times y. So now, this gives me, you know, I'm, I'm, what I want to show you is that this element of the class group gives you a new type of binary quadratic form. So elements now of sim 2 v tensor L are still given by ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, but no longer are a, b, and c allowed to be any elements of the ring. a has to be an OK, b has to be in the ideal, and c has to be in the square of the ideal. Um, so that's a little more complicated than requiring a, b, and c to all be in the ring. But I hope uh, that, you, that you feel that this is a pretty simple thing, too. Now you, know, you have to write down uh, three, three numbers, but they're not all in OK. They might be required to be in, in some ideal. And the other kind of change here um, is that instead of GL2, before, when V was uh, just a free rank 2 module, we had GL2 acting on it. Now, the group GLV that acts on the form to give us the equivalence classes, replacing the GL2 as the equivalence class, is a group of matrices where instead of having elements of OK in each place, I have elements of OK up here. It's, these are still just 2 by 2 matrices. These are elements of I, elements of I inverse, and elements of OK but still, uh, still something fairly concrete. Of course, here there's only one non-principal ideal class. And so for this specific um, maximal order, we can just take usual binary quadratic forms with a, b, and c all in the ring. And we can also take this type of binary quadratic forms. And that'll give us all the binary quadratic forms over this ring. In general, if we had a bigger class group of our uh, maximal order, then we'd have uh, you know, we'd have to do this kind of construction uh, for an I ideal in each, in each class. And we'd have some list of types of binary quadratic forms. And in fact, the types of binary quadratic forms, I think, have appeared in this conference um, already. Uh, there's uh, uh, morally, with, with a few sort of transformations, um, when we're on Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves, uh, this distinction between um, degenerate and non-degenerate divisors, divisors that you have to use two points to represent uh, minus twice infinity or just one point to represent, if you untangled that in, in this language in a, in a certain context, it would essentially be uh, coming down to two types of binary quadratic forms. Uh, so this. Uh, so this is something that, in, in some example, we've already seen with these different types of divisors on Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves. Um, and if you moved into higher and higher genus, you, and you were trying to compute uh, on those Jacobians, which you, know, you may not be interested for cryptographic reasons, but for other reasons, if you wanted to compute on those, you would essentially see that more types appear for, for reasons um, that are coming from something like this. Um, so in this case, say, um, over a maximal order in a number field, the question of uh, reduction theory is, is almost entirely open. There's some very recent work of Cremona on it. Um, 
But it actually would have lots of interesting op applications, not just in this context, um, but um, for some other um, number theoretic applications. And so it's, it's a pretty simple case, pretty close to, to the integers that we're, we're used to working with. Um, but the reduction theory here, I think, is a great open problem. Um, and the composition, um, in a, a practical sense, is an open problem. Uh, theoretically, the composition is given. I describe to you um, very geometrically this correspondence. And you know on the right-hand side that uh, we have the class group. You just multiply elements over there. And that gives you um, the composition on the binary forms. But I think to understand this practically, for example, to, to um, implement it is, uh, is, a, is quite a bit trickier. One of the reasons why is that in this case where you have different types of binary quadratic forms, um, composition is locally given by, by universal formulas in the sense that these modules uh, v and l, I said, were locally free rank uh, 2 and rank 1 are modules. And so locally where they are free, um, the composition is given by the global formula. But patching together those formulas um, that you have locally into a global answer, I think, is, is a non-trivial problem. Um, so understanding the composition law explicitly where uh, V and L are, are non-trivial, I, th I think, would be really uh, great. And have, it would have a lot of applications. So for example, uh, in some examples where OK has non-trivial class group, um, even in the example uh, where R is P1, OK, so now we have, in this example, you know, R was a ring. Well, OK, well, now it's P1, whatever all of that meant. But I still essentially defined for you uh, what a binary quadratic form would be. Um, so this is a, a parameterized Jacobians of hyperliptic curves. But now I'm thinking of them as double covers of the projective line instead of double covers of the affine line. Theoretically, that makes almost no difference whatsoever. Um, but uh, practically, uh, this kind of coordination of Jacobians of hyperliptic curves is, is different. Um, P1 has uh, non-trivial rank 2 modules and rank 1 modules. And so uh, you get actually, you know, you're writing down different things. And this case would be interesting because somehow we know that it can't be that far off from uh, working over A1, which is already well understood. Um, so we sort of know what the answer has to look like, but maybe it will help us get a handle on these subtleties that come from having, um, having non-free rank 2 and rank 1 modules. But lots of other examples. For example, instead of P1, um, if you worked with R and elliptic curve, you would parameterize then Jacobians of what are called bi-elliptic curves. Bi-elliptic curves just mean curves with a degree 2 cover to an elliptic curve. And so this is... This is uh, a very would be very new territory. And perhaps instead of doing this, you might first work in the affine case. So work with an affine elliptic curve. A max, so working with actually a ring here, a maximal order in a function field of an elliptic curve. And this would still um, you know, approximately give you Jacobians of bi-elliptic curves. And the affine case is probably easier than, than starting with the projective case. Um, so I mean, these are just sort of the first examples beyond what we already know and understand. And I think uh, there are already a lot of, of interesting open, open and, and I think reasonably accessible things to understand. OK, so, so far I've uh, told you this, this very long story about forms that parameterize class groups of quadratic algebras or quadratic extensions or double covers. Those are three ways of saying the same thing. Um, but this, again, is actually one step in a much larger story. Um, and this larger story has only, I think, become apparent uh, uh, recently. So for example, um, I, I'm going to give a theorem. And it, it was first shown over z. And I'm just using uh, the function field case here, because maybe it's, uh, it's more familiar. So here is a bijection between, so it's a, supposed to be a similar kind of thing. On the one hand, we have GL2Z cross GL3Z cross GL3Z classes of primitive pairs of 3 by 3 matrices over our ring. And then on the right-hand side, we have isomorphism classes of trigonal curves 
over our field and elements of their class group. So I'm going to unwind what, what all of these uh, things mean, but I hope to, to convince you that it's a pretty strong analogy to, to the theorems we've, we've seen before. So that's the same theorem. I just moved it up. So uh, I said pairs A, B of three by three matrices. Really, it should, you should view it as a three-dimensional two by three by three matrix, uh, which you could also think of as a trilinear form. And that tells you how GL2, GL3, and GL3 act, because it's a 2 by 3 by 3 matrix. It's a trilinear form. So they act, it acts on those three sides of the, the three-dimensional matrix. Um, so again, it's very concrete. Writing down AB now, instead of giving three elements, is giving 18 elements of this, of this base ring, um, which, is, which is certainly more than uh, three. But on the other hand, is uh, is is very concrete. Uh, the reduction theory, you might think, oh, GL2, GL3, GL3. I mean, this is some huge group you now have to do reduction theory for. But the reduction theory can be done for each of these groups separately. So before, we had to know how to do a GL2 reduction theory. That, in some sense, can be carried over. And now the question is doing a GL3. I mean, the only really new ingredient reduction theory-wise would be doing the GL3 um, reduction theory. Um, so that's what this stuff on the left is. Certainly, it's a bigger case, um, but I think morally uh, pretty similar uh, to the forms we had before. Um, and then trigonal curves. So trigonal curves are just curves with degree 3 um, maps to the line. So we've been talking a lot about hyperelliptic curves. Hyperelliptic curves are curves with degree 2 maps to the line. And trigonal curves are just curves with degree 3 maps to the line. So this is telling you about the class groups of triple covers of whatever base you're working over. Here, I'm working over the affine line over um, FQ. Um, and this class group is just the same. For smooth curves, the class group is just the Jacobian. So this gives a parameterization of Jacobians of, say, for example, uh, of trigonal curves over FQ. Um, but the story, I mean, you know, now that I told you that there's a, uh, an n equals 3 case, you probably won't be too surprised that the story doesn't stop with uh, these cubic extensions or triple covers. So in fact, um, uh, we have a bijection. And now, the great thing is that it, it doesn't, the, the complications that came from the n equals 2 to the n equals 3 case, you might think it's just going to kind of keep getting worse and bigger and bigger. But it's actually fairly uh, well behaved. So now on the left-hand side, I have something that looks very similar to what I uh, had before. I've just replaced 3 by n. So I have GL2z cross GLNz cross GLNz classes of pairs of n by n matrices. Or really, you should think of this as a 2 by n by n sort of three-dimensional matrix, say, over, over your favorite ring, like FQT. And on the right-hand side, I now have isomorphism classes of, of c C and D, where C is a certain kind of n gonal curve over FQ, and D is an element of the class group of C. So it's another story um, for another day. Uh, one can actually say exactly which n gonal curves appear here, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to tell you that, that some of them uh, appear. But what I'd like to, to make clear today is that the curves that appear, even though it's not all ingonal curves, you get their entire class group. Uh, so while you, don't get, while you don't get all the curves, you get their entire class group. So you have a complete composition law on the left-hand side. Um, any two elements, you can compose them, and, the, and their product will, in fact, be another 2 by n by n matrix. Um, so what are n-gonal curves? Well, as you might guess, n-gonal curves are curves with degree n covers uh, to the line. So uh, here, you know, uh, the line I'm talking about is A1, because I'm talking about this, this specific example, um, uh, FQ bracket T. Um, and so as with binary quadratic forms, there is a version of this theorem over any ring or variety or scheme or anything. I mean, I've given you one example here working over FQ bracket T, which tells you about um, the Jacobians of certain ingonal curves. But uh, you could take the integers, of course, and you could. And here we've got class groups of certain orders and rank in uh, number fields. Uh, you could take, 
you know, again, the plane, elliptic curves, and get, uh, and get a lot of different, um, and get a lot of different examples. So this is just, this is just one example. Um, so uh, this is the same theorem, just moved up. And I think, that, so there are a lot of problems uh, here. So for in, even greater than or equal to 3, even equal to 3, um, to implement these composition laws explicitly, um, like I said, we know theoretically that they exist, but uh, implementing them explicitly is an open uh, problem and I think would be, would be very useful. Um, and to understand the reduction theory. So here, even with just one n and, and your favorite, favorite base ring, um, I think that, say, with the integers, it might not be too hard. And then you could uh, go from there to try to consider other, other cases. But here, so of course, I would suggest starting with the n equals 3 case. And I think that these, these computational problems are, um, you know, are, are completely open and very accessible. and uh, like I said, these results already have lots of theoretical applications, and I think it would be great if we could also use them, uh, use them computationally. So I think uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Other questions? Yes, Jim. Yeah. Is it easy to describe how you go from your array of uh, two by n by n array yeah, so uh, she asked, how do you go from your 2 by n by n array and get uh, the curve? And I will tell you, it's very easy to say. I'll try to tell you on the top of this board over here. So um, A and B are n by n matrices. OK, um, so if I take the determinant, so AX plus B y. So here x and y are formal, and I'm just uh, formally making this n by n matrix, and I'm taking this determinant. So this then is a binary, binary just means two variables, x and y, binary form of degree n. Okay. And remember before, I had this example where ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared cut out a curve in a1 cross P1, well, the fact that, that this was a degree 2 in x and y didn't matter. Similarly, if I have a binary form, you know, a0, x to the n, a1, x to the n minus 1, y, plus a n, y to the n, this also cuts out a, a curve in a1 cross P1. Um, now, uh, now with a degree in map to A1 instead of a degree 2 map. So it's completely analogous to the binary quadratic forms uh, situation. So there's, so yeah, you just take the deter this determinant and that gives you, um, gives you the degree in cover. Any further questions? This might be a little off yeah. the wall, but um, something about this description on the right reminds me of the H. Haferavich group, which you can um, describe in terms of curves. I was wondering if your um, theories and techniques say anything about the H. Haferavich. Um, well, I mean, uh, not, it, oh, yeah, I should repeat the question. So uh, she said that, that, the, that this description um, was uh, reminiscent of the Tate Haferavich group uh, and was. Was this was this related, or did it have some? Um, yeah. 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 So and so, does this theory kind of some uh, relate to that? Well, the best answer that I can give you is so not these examples that I'm that I'm talking about, but other examples of parameterizations of these algebraic objects by forms. Um, are related to, um, in Carl Rubin's talk, he mentioned this theorem of Bhargava where they had uh, gotten that, uh, Bhargava and Shankar, where they had gotten uh, uh, you know, information about uh, average two Selmer and then three Selmer. So those kinds of counts come from, from similar parameterizations that are part of this story. I don't know that it ever really gets 
uh, the hands on the Tate Shaver Average group in the, exactly the way you probably would would want to. Um, but yeah, that that is related to to at least uh, getting working explicitly with these two Selmer groups. Any further questions? If not, then please join me thanking the speaker again.